there is a woman, but we don't see the woman. And with Patricia's work, there is the thoughts, the emotions of the woman, but also that's, that's kept empty within the tea bags. So I love this duality, I love this dialogue, and, and I wanted to do um, something on fashion as an independent skin on its own, showcasing these two artworks, these two body of works, and uh, just highlighting the duality within each and between them as well. Maybe just to turn the floor to the artists um, to explain a bit what, how they created the works. And we have Una, whose works, the eight pieces that you see here, have been previously exhibited. Um, they are made in 2008. And Patricia has been specifically commissioned to do the works that you see. Um, and they utilize the space in a specific way, as you can see. You know, they, the space within an exhibition speaks to them in different ways, as well as the artworks util utilizes the cartel, something that we spoke about when we recently met. How, Patricia, have you specifically worked, um, obviously, with the tea bags and, and this ephemeral quality that you've given to the pieces? How have you worked with the space to, to create what you see here? Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, to me, I'm very interested, was very influenced by the Japanese in the 1980s, their Japanese fashion, and it changed my whole idea art. I was doing performance art, but whenever I saw the Japanese, uh, I realized that you could deconstruct in clothing. And so it wasn't actually anymore about the clothes were fitting our body. We were actually, it was about us. So I started working more and more and more on deconstructing all objects. But whenever I came to the Middle East, my whole way of thinking changed. It's 35 years ago. And I realized that the more, the more multiplicity of units is in all my work. The multiplicity in the tea bags, in the coffee filters, in any work that I'm using. I normally do much larger installations with like hundreds of pieces. You go completely through the surface. You don't see it anymore. Although there was a point when I was working with my two interns, thank them very much, and Zena, where we really didn't see tea bags anymore. You just get lost in this meditative record way of working. But it is about the spaces between the tea bags. It's about the spaces where nothing happens. When I first started doing it, the women's stories, when I interviewed and talked to women, they were inside the words. But then it ceased to be about their conversations. It was about their very spirit. And it's, so it's the spaces where there aren't the tea bags, where there aren't the tea, where there isn't any women, where it, the work actually becomes alive. And so the first piece Colors were about the child dagger, where women and allowed me to enter into their social life by giving me tea and the hospitality of Arabia. And I come from Ireland where everything is on a cup of tea, which you can agree, that's it. Um, but the Japanese tea bags were cleaner and simpler because they allowed me to increase the space. And we don't have it in the West, we have positive and negative, but we don't have space where nothing happens, created specifically, and that's what I call my work, the spirit of Ma, where there is nothing, so we can enter into it, and then everything, by the time you do this, I'm sure the interns will even agree, it all becomes an illusion, and so it's the spirit of the women that inspired me to live college, but then when I saw Una's work, it was, I could believe that, you know, I trust me completely, as a curator. So putting the two together was May's idea, but it seems the most natural thing when it's a place like this. So it's what the spaces between and the stillness of my that I hope the dialect between the viewer looking at the work, the energy they would bring to me is more important than the actual object. Thank you. And, and Una, you're, um, these pieces have been exhibited before, but not, if I'm, from my right, they're not, not all together in this manner. How do you find that they've interacted specifically, as Patricia's saying, with her works? There's a lightness of being, if we can say, with what Patricia's done, and, and there, is, there is a lightness, but also a, a very strong um, hardness, and yet a constricted nature, some, perhaps you could say, to the works that you've done, the leather, leather bound, almost armor type garments, how, how, do you, how do they react with the space and the art? Um, yeah, well, similar to Patricia's, mine is very much about 
the emptiness and what's not there and um, what we as societies associate with um, you know gestures leading us to tell to to know a story even though the, the wearer or the, the piece is empty it, each piece is a gesture associated with um, a previous story that's happened in a previous moment in somebody's life I was looking at um, the casts from Pompeii and how um, news captured like within those captured the moment of the ending of somebody's life in a very significant moment this is basically the same kind of thing. So it's each, the way that the pieces are, are exhibited here, they're interacting with each other to tell a story. So depending on how the pieces are exhibited beside each other, they can tell a different story. But, um, I was looking at um, uh, how the human mind copes with traumatic experience and how physicality reflects that maybe a mental trauma or something um, and also how the spirit is so strong that um, the body and the mind creates resilience and so that's why the pieces are actually very structural. I was looking at medieval war armor as a visual representation of emotional barriers that people build up as a coping mechanism after a traumatic experience um, and also I liked what you mentioned about there being a stillness um, because that's also very important in the coping um, from and the recovery stages from a traumatic experience because you almost, you know, we'll say if you need to go for counselling, you need to settle and you need to concentrate on this thing that you really don't want to concentrate on, um, but you need to give it the attention that it needs in order to recover from it and move past it. And so, Having, having, you know, seen people, I've sat exhibitions from, from day one where these pieces have been exhibited and people have come in and looked at them and they don't know that I'm the person that made them and, and to see that they look at something and go, oh God, and, and it's interesting that there isn't anybody there but people get a real feeling for what it is that's going on in someone's life, somebody that's not even there. I also looked at the work of Hans Belmer and it's about, um, you know, he created the doll which he photographed in different environments and different scenarios and, and people, there was uproar to his work because this suggested human being was put in difficult um, situations and it's through association that people understand and so terrible for going on tangents. I don't know <laughs> I'm getting okay. to the point at all. Something, <laughs> but I think <laughs> it's an Irish thing. <laughs> but some, <laughs> something that just came to mind when you were speaking, you know, was that obviously there's the stillness and there's the, the idea of recovery as you mentioned from a traumatic experience but there is um, there's also gentleness I find in the, in the postures and there's a peace and that sort of radiates within the whole space, within the whole exhibition. Yeah. And the, I think the leather also acts, at least what it seems to me, as a protective shield as well. There is, it's, it's protecting, it's yeah, healing it's from the trauma. And it's also, you know, the fact that it's leather, it's skin, we're all, we all have skin. The, it's all cow skin that I use, and, and each, each animal's skin, you know, there's an energy from that previous life or put into this physical energy that I've put into the same as Patricia's energy into those each and every detail like the, the repetition it's almost like prayer all of that you know there's something very peaceful about the process even more so than the final product when you think of women's work especially like when I first came to live in more rural areas of the Middle East. Women's work has this repetitive day in, day out action. And that was one of the things that first I started. But of course the repetition to me was the use of uh, Islam and repeated motifs in Islamic art history. Uh, before I worked with um, uh, fabrics and things, I was doing it within, within papers. But I love, for me, I love that. I have a paper and one is so grounded and paper to me it's just it just evaporates. 
it's it's not for any longer than the life of me. It's, you know, it's, the, it's like the opposite, and yet they come together. So that lasts, and mine doesn't. So, Ironically, like the body lasts, but the spirit maybe lives on. Yeah, to me, it's better. It's the spirit. It's the spirit of what's behind the work for me that matters. That's why it's very still. I mean, with that, I th the other thing that links Una and Patricia's work is the, in these works, is the, the collar and the neck, I think, which is an interesting element to both of them. How, how do you, perhaps Patricia, you could explain a bit how in your work the, the collar surrounding the neck, how that is a theme within these works for, for the female body? To me, the neck is just such an important part to me of the body. It's like, to me, it's always been like a bridge, like a join. You know, I used to be a dancer, and you're always protecting your neck. It's an area that you really need because it holds this that moves to this that thinks. So to me, I became fascinated with the neck, and I used to do lots of drawings just at the neck of people. And when, you, the, when I came first, I, I loved the fashion, uh, clothing, more costume than even fashion, the single costume. And I'd done a series of drawings of rocks. But when I came then, like 20 years after that, to the Middle East, the jewellery, I was doing a lot of talismanic jewellery. Sorry to mention the talismans, it's another conversation, another tangent. But I was doing a lot with jewellery, and the importance of women carrying everything they own on their neck, more than on their hands, because we need to use them. So it was not even rings, it was these big circles around here. And it also is, like energy-wise, aura-wise, a very strong area in men and women. And so the neck became fundamental to me. And I noticed that through studying uh, the costumes of women's clothes at Arabia, which I've been doing for about having a museum soon, is another time. But the, the fact that they still now use, in the, or they've used for years, the design of the collar comes onto the dress. Because it's so important to have this circular motif in the costume, whether it's back or front. And, you know, when you think of dance and the turn and the circle and Sufi faith, it's so important to me. The uh, Rumi has influenced my work since I was a child. Because my father really followed the work of Rumi. So I've always had this calmness and stillness within movement. And it just seemed natural that this circle turning completeness would be used within my work. And what more beautiful to do to decorate this Luna's work, the parts that I think are essential, because it is very essential for me, is this area. In Japan, this is like the mid pages, but we showed that part. That was where everything happened. And then I'm going <laughs> And Una, your work has sometimes been, as Patricia slightly alluded to, in terms of a central almost um, as a fetish form, yeah. but going back. She didn't say fetish. I said fetish. She said sensual. Okay, I'm well aware. Yeah. I, I don't see that. Actually, I see, I see more towards what Patricia sees. But just alluding to what the research and what I've read and, and seen about your work and going back to the neck and how this, that part of the body, as Patricia has said, can allude to that, those many meanings and elements. How, how do you feel and how do you feel about that Sort of relating to Patricia's work as well. Yeah, well, for me, there was a deliberate restriction actually of the neck for the concept that was behind it about the um, trauma and recovery, and I feel that, you know, uh, in order to protect the self, so that fight very much in the the pieces, the arms are restricted. The neck is also restricted in a lot of them because we use our voice to, um, uh, I guess, get help or or help ourselves. So it's it's needed as a recovery the neck area. Um, with regard to the connection, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting how I've specifically restricted the neck. There isn't actually neck kind of area in your pieces and they kind of they work so many ways you know in so many ways they fill each other's gaps the two the two worlds I think and, and also cover the same areas in other kind of ways.
ways of thinking about it. Um, regarding the elephant in the room, fetish business. <laughs> Actually, um, everybody else saw that in it, but for me, it really isn't anything to do with that. Um, in one way, I guess, I am aware, like I read a lot of psychology papers about people's coping mechanisms and that kind of thing, and, and common ground, so um, the building of emotional barrier was one of them. But also, yeah, sometimes turning to things like that is actually certain people's um, way of recovery, and that's, you know, completely fine. But um, it really wasn't that big a deal for me, actually. Everybody else seems to think of it more than I do. I, I'm quite naive, possibly. <laughs> but it was no more for me about um, capturing, capturing the gesture. And to me, in terms of curating that, and I, I think what curating the exhibition and what Una just said, the works here complement, you know, the missing part. Maybe there's a finite versus an infinite quality. There's groundedness there's versus something that's ephemeral and transcendent. How did you space and position the works? Um, obviously, using using the coordinating with the artist, but how did how did they how did you do that so that, that those feelings come through to the audience in the space? Um, Una's work is um, appears to be at least very physical, so it's very structured and uh, there is yes this idea of repetition and the idea of layers and the leather which uh, appears to be heavy and stiff when in fact it's very soft. With Patricia's work, it's the paper, and it's this infinite number of paper. And throughout the process, we even did not know when to interrupt this meditative, infinite process of building up uh, the tea bags because there, there, you cannot hit pause to such a such a process of um, uh, symbolizing women's thoughts. And uh, to me, it's always been about the woman. And it was interesting because it's coming from a female curator working with two female artists. So it was I, I'm not being a feminist or anything, but it did have this female. Um, uh, character uh, to the show and um, when it came to the woman I thought this physical kind of leather like pieces have got this duality within because they appear to, to be as you said earlier quite uh, restraining uh, we, you know, with this whole kind of idea of bounding the arms to the back to the front all these uh, gestures that the pieces suggest but uh, we've uh, uh, we've showcased them almost like floating so there is this duality as well in the presentation so what should be what's calling for that groundness especially that piece in the center with the what, what we internally refer to as the praying piece it's almost calling for a plinth underneath but we decided to, to float it where for instance with, with uh, Patricia's pieces they're very very light it's this infinite empty tea bag there is no tea in between because it's this idea of absence and uh, instead of having them as floating like ghost like dresses uh, I've decided to kind of to ground them within so every piece of Patricia is actually rests on something while every piece of Ona is is, um, is floating and only in that central in that collaborative piece we see them uh, uh, joined together in the central installation and it's the only piece of Ona that finally opens up to pour out almost uh, Patricia's uh, series of untold stories so to me this idea of absence is is very much there here you see it more because it's a physical kind of absence. You almost know or can tell the woman who was in there and, and that exact gesture that she was having. But with Patricia, it's all about the memories and it's all about the thoughts of the woman. So it's, it's fashion as a skin, that's, it's, a, it's an envelope. And uh, being a trained architect, uh, I was always fascinated by the idea of enclosure. Uh, but to me, I mean, this could be a building and, this, and the body could be the site. I mean, it's all about uh, the three-dimensional um, enclosure that, that actually encases something. So with, with Ona's pieces, they're more like encasing the body of, uh, of, the, of the woman. And with Patricia's, it's encasing uh, the mind and the spirit. So when they, when they work, I believe they kind of complement each other beautifully. And it's also then the duality with the, with the edginess and the softness, because what appears to be quite hard is actually soft leather. And what appears to be light is, could be quite edgy and, and sharp. So there is duality within, there's duality in between, there's the idea of absence and, and with the, even with the color tones, with that tan skin color and with the whiteness, it's, it's got this purity about it and overall and, and uh, it's like skin meets soul kind of dialogue that, uh, that I very much enjoyed working with. It's, it's very beautiful. And is that in terms of the title, Second Skin, what is the second skin for well, you? Uh, 
Well, second skin, I mean, as, as Patricia can point out uh, earlier, there is always this, this gap, this um, uh, in between two, two skins. And even architecture is also quite important. And deconstruction is also very important. So to me, the idea of second skin almost suggests that there is, there is a skin that envelops the body, but then there is the in, a skin that envelops the mind. And it's that fashion itself is a second skin that we, that we wear, that we decide on every day. And I know when you drop in the word fashion and arts context, many people freak out. But uh, it is very much uh, a skin worth interpreting, worth looking at the layers that go within the... And if you compare both of them, they are all constructed of using a similar process of building up of layers, the repetition that Patricia was talking about earlier, you can see it in Una's work. And, and also the softness and, and the sensuality, if, if we're allowed to, to mention that again. And, and the ideas of, of healing uh, that uh, Una was talking about also finds itself in, those kind of, in the fragility of uh, Patricia's pieces. So uh, I believe that there is kind of a silent dialogue of, of this leather, leather versus paper that uh, brings it all to life. Really, um, there's really a healing in both works. I think that's also what unites them. Um, and speaking about fashion as a, as a second skin or fashion as art, that it is a question I, I thought would be good to pose to two artists and artists that work within the realms. And May, who works, who's been so instrumental in bringing art and fashion together at the cartel. Why is fashion art and why can art be fashion and vice versa? I'll let you participate or whoever would like to answer. <laughs> What was the question? Why is fashion not art, and why is art not fashion? Or why is, why, there, why is there an issue? <laughs> why is fashion art, and why is art fashion? Why, how can fa fashion is an art ultimately? Yeah, I've had I've had plenty of these discussions. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I feel that fashion can be art in. I mean, the process that goes into it. The, I think, the more thought that's behind it makes it more art, more close to art. I mean, just making a dress or a t-shirt to wear for the sake of wearing it, I think that wouldn't be so much art, but when there is the amount of thought and the amount of um, physical effort, I think, as well, gone into it, the same way as a painter takes months and months and months over painting. I mean, these pieces, and, and even with my, my fashion collections aside, um, I'll, I'll work physically on the stand. I will build something up. I will go away and I'll come back in two days and I'll look at it again. And I do think that that process, I think it sometimes comes down to the process. Um, you know, in, in working in that way, I'm creating something up the space in weeks and months. So I don't see what the difference is um, with, with fashion. You know, I think it works. I think it, I think it is art. For me, um, I'm not making things that people necessarily wear, although well, you could wear the paper colours. But to me, I get my inspiration as an artist from high fashion, from simplicity of forms. Um, and that's actually the link why I came, that's how I came to meet May, because this is an inspiring place to me. I came to Cartel and I get inspired. Um, I don't have this very outdated division. You know, when I started out, you had art, and then somewhere, almost unmentionable, you had the crafts, and design, and the two design, and all the rest. And I don't have that, and I think those barriers are going. And if it hadn't been, as I said earlier, for the deconstruction of, in the sort of uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, in fashion, and everybody, whether you call yourself an artist or a creative being, makes a conscious decision. We say, oh, just threw it on, they don't. And clothing says so much about who we are. It's like these things say who the woman is in her absence. A fragrance of a woman as she just goes by will say more about who she is. And to me, fashion is the art form that we all participate in. I am so over these boring things that says we have fashion. We have art, we have design. When you go to the design, downtown design, you see things that are amazing, that link all this together where they can get it. Unfortunately, somebody like me sets up cartels so artists can realize that there is something else outside these divisions. 
movement. To me, it is our identity. It's like the fed is in a women's word. You don't have to say, just do it, we do it, and the rest follows. So to me, fashion is an art form. And I'm not talking about just, I mean, Joseph Boyce, what was he doing with his felt? Fashion. Which is a very good point. I sometimes think about it in the same terms as where do you decide what is a painting, what is a piece of sculpture? Um, and maybe posing the question, how far out from the canvas does the paint need to come for it to become a sculpture? So it's, it's those kind of blurred lines as well, so fashion and art is worn on the body. You know, if this was exhibited here with somebody wearing it, would it be dismissed as fashion? But because it's, it doesn't have a body inside it, art you know there, there actually can be kind of middle of the road areas your, your work when it has been worn by Rihanna by major celebrities and stars celebs in. put the celebs <laughs> yeah. in who are wearing who are wearing the these art yeah. artworks or fashion garments whatever yeah, you'd well, like to call them um, with the pieces that they've worn I consider them as fashion collections more so because they're intended for wearing. These aren't intended really for wearing. They're using the can using the body as a canvas almost. That was my approach to it. Not, I specifically made that decision when I was uh, creating this this work here. Um, and since then, I have made um, purely fashion collections. Um, but I really want to start making purely um, art pieces again. And the pieces um, exhibited in here, I don't know if you've seen it. Surprise! But that one has never been worn, it's got structural work on the inside and it won't ever be, be worn because I want it to be a piece of bigger to march. So trying to kind of work in all the front as well. Um, I mean apart from the uh, things, the obvious uh, similarities between fashion and art when it comes to you know, process, uh, aesthetics, um, rhythm, harmony, all these things that are, that are quite common. Um, I think when you look at the entire history of human being, I mean, it's been documented by two major things. You've got literature and you've got art. And fashion plays a big role in the art documentation, in the archival of how people acted, how they wore. You know, we mentioned colors earlier. But colors, they undertook this massive evolution throughout chapters of history. So we know a lot about people, what they wear, the layers that we see in films and how the actors takes a layer after another in, in, in certain periods of time versus kind of the lightness of what we wear today. So it tells us a lot fashion about society, about people, about the evolution of humanity and it's instrumental in the documentation of humanity. Uh, and I believe that's, that, that's a role of fashion plays. Uh, I was in um, uh, London attending the opening of uh, 100 Years of Vogue the British Vogue recently uh, celebrated a century of uh, the magazine and I went to the exhibition and I looked at the photographs, many early work from the 1920s or 1930s and you look at it and you think, but that's not fashion, I mean, where is the fashion in that photo? It, some of it is portraiture, some of it it's, but it's just, it's the very presence of the construction of the image and of having, even if it was subtle, elements of fashion that really makes it fashion photography and that made it to that magazine pages at the time so uh, to me it's very instrumental in, in archiving and documenting who we are as people and also what's what's happening around us and it's as may has just said very eloquently it's a marker of our contemporary society of our history of of every day and we we are artworks in ourselves in a way we're walking around wearing something i can see many people in the audience having their own identity markers in their own way and I think that's that's what makes us all very individual and, and unique.